my name is Adriana Norris, and I'm a member of the ASBNB Science Outreach and Communication C Committee. And today I'm so excited to be spotlighting Parmvir Baya, who is also a member of the ASBNB Science Outreach and Communication Committee. And today she is going to tell us all about the outreach that she's been doing and also how her work on the committee has shaped her work outside of the committee. So welcome, Parmvir. How are you doing? Hey, Adriana. I'm doing well, thank you. Um, thank you for being here. I'm a little bit jet lagged from traveling, but yeah. That happens. <laughs> <laughs> so we can actually dive right into the interview. So the first thing I want to ask you is how did you get into outreach? Oh, goodness. Um, I suspect I felt like, without knowing what the words were, um, that I would like to do something like this after the uh, Andrew Wakefield scandal. So this was the British physician who published an article in The Lancet on how the MMR vaccine uh, caused autism in children, which has obviously sis since been debunked and uh, his medical license been revoked and the article has been retracted. Um, but obviously that did a fair amount of damage. And it occurred to me that some of that is likely to be due to the kind of limited access that people have to the work that scientists do. Um, and so one of the things before uh, I moved to the US uh, was that I volunteered for an organization called Sense About Science, mm -hmm. uh, and they promote the public interest in sound, sound evidence-based science. Mm -hmm. uh, so they reach out to researchers, politicians, and they go through kind of media stuff, and they try and make sure that the science that's being presented is accurate. Um, and through my own observations of kind of the very technical language that scientists use and, you know, who's represented within the field of science, I knew I wanted to do something. And so a group of us got together and formed um, an organization we now called Scientists Inc. Uh, and so for this, we've been running uh, an annual festival called Taste of Science, which is for adults to go and hear from scientists in kind of fun venues. Uh, we record a podcast called Two Scientists, uh, where I interview, um, actually, no, David now does a Spanish language one. Uh, we talk to researchers about how they got into their respective fields, what they study, their challenges and their achievements. Um, as well as that, our organization has now uh, been able to sponsor other science outreach and communication uh, initiatives. And one is called the Symposium Academic Stand Up, which is super fun, run by my friend Kyle Marion, who um, creates, uh, in her own words, culturally relevant educational activities. And essentially, she gets academics to, to perform stand up um, in a kind of very socially conscious way. Uh, and another uh, group that we're supporting at the moment is an organization called Científico Latino, and they have a graduate student membership initiative, uh, which is to support applicants trying to get into grad school, um, but specifically from minoritized backgrounds. Um, I also now record podcasts for other organizations, including Moffitt Cancer Center on health disparities within cancer um, and one for the Society for Mathematical Biology. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot. So you don't have that much experience is what I'm hearing. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> no, no, just a, little, just a smidge. <laughs> uh, in, in all honesty, though, that I mean, that's been 10 years and I am still learning. There's no way I'm not going to keep picking up stuff over the years. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that is very cool. Um, so you mentioned a lot of the efforts, that, the outreach efforts that you've been involved in. Can you talk about some of the primary goals and who are the target audiences for some of the outreach projects you've been doing? So actually, um, I've just realized I didn't mention the one project which we've done most recently. So another one under the banner of Scientists Inc. is what we've called the Sensational SciFest. Um, and so this is something we started planning before the pandemic broke out. Uh, and the tagline for that is exploration without limitations. So essentially, we created this with sensory sensitive individuals in mind. So I don't know if you've ever been to a science festival. There are um, a bunch of big ones across the U.S., particularly mm -hmm. in um, Massachusetts, New York. Um, and a lot of them tend to be very big, very loud, uh, lots of cool, flashy lights, um, which is great to get kids excited. But obviously, for anybody with sensory uh, issues, this becomes a huge challenge, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
And so we wanted to be able to create a, a safe, accessible space for them to have the same kind of fun experiences, uh, but without hopefully having that kind of overwhelm, or if they do, that we have some kind of things in place for them to be able to go and decompress if they need to. Um, and so we held our very first event this year uh, at, in collaboration with an amazing org organization called AMROC, which is uh, our local fab lab in Tampa. And they gave us their space, they gave us their equipment, they gave us their volunteers, um, and we were able to kind of adapt the space um, to be able to be accessible for kids from this particular demographic. Mm -hmm. um, and we also did this in collaboration with the Center for Autism and uh, Related Disabilities, which is a kind of research and uh, service providing organization at USF. Um, and what they do is they give people training to be able to understand what uh, an individual might be experiencing and how you can adapt to space um, so that they can they can navigate it as they need to. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's really cool. So your target audience there is it? It's children in that case. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That is very cool. So from that outreach effort, what would you say sort of the most significant outcome or achievement was from the effort? Um, well, one of the first achievements was just holding the event mm -hmm. uh, because uh, our organizing committee comprises five people, four of whom are neurodiverse themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and so for us to be able to even have meetings to make sure that everybody could attend and in a way that was helpful to them mm -hmm. uh, was something of a challenge. So having the event, um, but also the, you know, our primary goal with this particular event was to have um that safe space to make sure that kids, when they came in, they got to have this fun and engaging experience and that, you know, it wasn't just for them, but their families as well. And so um, we think the outcome was achieved, thankfully. That's great. So you just mentioned some of like the awesome outcomes from the event. So what were some of the challenger challenges or obstacles that you had to face and how did you overcome these obstacles? Obviously, one of the first things is making sure that all of our volunteers got the training that they needed. So um, we didn't want to have anybody there who was completely unfamiliar with what we were trying to do, uh, especially since, you know, the way that some of this uh, comes across in the kids who get overwhelmed is quite often, um, you know, they, they have a meltdown in a public space, mm -hmm. right? So uh, making sure that everybody was on board with the training and literally all of our uh, the people running the exhibits uh, to anyone, even just setting up at the front desk, they were all familiar with this. Um, I guess that was less of a challenge since we had the card from uh, USF helping us out with that training. Um, but yeah, th it would be something that if we were running a much bigger event since this was a pilot, that was um, easier for us to organize. Um, another one was that given that we had this kind of a, a specific audience in mind, so not just kids, but sensory sensitive kids, how were we going to open up this event to allow people in? So if you had uh, a lot of people attending, um, then potentially you were just going to create a, a loud environment just from the sheer numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and also how to, to make it accessible to one group, but not exclusive so that anybody could attend and enjoy themselves. Um, and so the challenge with that, we decided to go with ticketing, which um, it was free, but we asked people to RSVP. Um, and I think the problem with that was that we didn't have as many people as we would have liked. Um, and so just for the people who were running uh, the the stations, they had far fewer people than they expected, which I guess that's that's also one of the nice outcomes because it meant that anybody who attended got a very kind of personalized experience with mm -hmm. the scientists they were speaking with. Um, but yeah, obviously that's a double-edged sword. So uh, I think we would try in future to find another way, although this was in a public space, we actually held it in a mall. Um, mm -hmm. okay. So that it's, yeah, it was, it was kind of curious. Um, so we had some people walking by, but I think the way we advertised it potentially wasn't good enough to get just walk in traffic um, because they felt like it was a private event. Oh, I see. So, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. 
Um, so on the flip side, can you share what strategies or approaches that you use that worked really, really well? Um, and what kind of factors contributed to their success? Um, again, this is going to come back to the training that we did with CARD and the fact that even before we started this event, um, we reached out to their kind of um, the the folks that they work with in the local community. So they have a lot of parents and children and actually adults as well with autism and other related neurodiverse issues. Mm -hmm. um, and what they do is they help them out with training. So uh, with looking after the kids, what can you do to help the kids decompress all the way through to adults? Like, how can we help you find a job? Um, that is going to be, and you know, find a way to be able to get the jobs that are relevant to your skills and relevant to your needs. Um, obviously, this this also requires your employers to be uh, in a position to create that space for you too. But um, in the process of doing that, we figured out that perhaps for each individual activity, one of the best ways to to make the space accessible is to have. Um, both signs to say whether something is going to have lights, colors, smells, sounds, all of these things. Uh, we had uh, a decompression space so that um, like the lights were dimmed. It had lots of comfy sofas. It had gentle music. It had, um, we had fidget toys at multiple stations. So there was always something that was going to um, allow the kids to hopefully, and we did have someone who was struggling. Um, mm -hmm. But because Card was also there as one of the the kind of the organizations with a booth of their own, um, they they actually knew that this this kid was their client, uh, and so they they helped the dad out with some suggestions as to how he could kind of leave the space and come back in. Um, so yeah, I think in terms of providing that safe space, I think we did a tremendous job, and um, we got some nice kudos from Card as a result of doing that. Yeah, that's great. I love the idea of a decompression space. I feel like I could honestly use that in any setting. <laughs> that's great. Absolutely. I mean, we had lots of people who um, don't have sensory issues and they just commented on how lovely that space was. Mm -hmm. um, and I think something that should be available in any kind of large, overwhelming space, mm -hmm. uh, conferences, for example. Yeah, that's a great idea. And so earlier we mentioned that we were both members of the ASBMV Science Outreach and Communication Committee. So I wanted to ask how has being a member of this committee influenced or guided your approach to your own sort of personal science outreach work? Oh, so many ways. Um, I mean, just being with a group uh, is an amazing experience. I have to say that working with this committee has been one of the most enjoyable things I've ever done. Um, but there are so many people who are part of it. So science communication is not necessarily my forte. And I have learned so much about um, the ability to use storytelling in how you kind of present your science. And that's, I think, been a hugely valuable thing to me. Um, but also there are a lot of people on our outreach committee who've done work with uh, K through 12, which I have very little experience with given that I'm not from the US and uh, I don't have kids of my own. And so this is kind of um, uh, an audience that I think was really kind of opened up to me as a possibility, obviously collaborating with other people who know more about the issue. Um, but for example, uh, our committee co-member, uh, Adelis, has huge amounts of experience and just kind of learning some of the the needs that the students have um has allowed me to kind of implement that in uh specifically this, this festival I was just talking about yeah that's great so can you talk about uh, if there's any specific instances where lessons that you learned from the committee actually helped you overcome a particular outreach challenge or improve a project you were working on yeah so I would say that um one of the things that has been really helpful being a part of the committee has been to be on um, the kind of grant review boards, these kinds of things um, to assess other people's work. And in the process of looking at these rubrics and considering uh, how other people are doing their outreach work has been super helpful into feeding back how we can do the same thing for our projects. Mm -hmm. um, so I can't think of a specific example, but there are 
I think the way in which you kind of start to create an activity, um, you know, starting from the ground up, what what are the considerations that you need with regard to your audience? Who is your audience, right? So um, not going into these things without giving, um, you know, serious consideration to the people that you're trying to work with. And that's another thing, working with communities, not working for or just making something for other people mm-hmm. um because you can make an awful lot of assumptions under those circumstances which are unfair irrelevant mm-hmm. you know um and could end up backfiring because especially given that one of our our major goals with this is to help make scientists a community of people that are more approachable mm-hmm. you know if you do a bad job of that you're more likely to create distrust um and think that you know these people are a group of elitists who don't have my best interests at heart. Um, so yeah, certainly the way we kind of assess projects, who is doing them, why they're doing them, that's that's also been applicable to our work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. I also, I really appreciate how you say, you know, saying working with the community, because you mentioned your outreach project with the sensory sensitive kids, you had neurodivergent people actually helping plan the event which seems like a really important aspect to keep in mind when you're planning projects. <laughs> I will I will say that on the basis of the fact that I did everything wrong when I first started doing outreach. <laughs> Just so you know, you know, it, we, we make mistakes and we learn while we're doing the work. Um, and so it's only a result of having lots of conversations with people who have far more experience than me um, that we've kind of come to this this status now. Yeah, that's great. So for our last question, I was going to ask you, can you provide us with some just general advice about doing outreach? So you've already given us a lot of good snippets if you wanted to give us anything else. Um, I think as well as the community piece, making sure that you're creating with communities, um, treat it like you do your science, right? You don't go into your science without doing the relevant research, without reading up on the backgrounds of things. Um, to understand where the the kind of the gaps are, there's no point in reproducing work that other people have already done a hundred times. Like, why won't why wouldn't you look for something new? Um, and also being able to evaluate and then iterate on the process, right? Make it better for next time. Uh, understand that it's not going to be perfect the first time, and giving yourself some space to forgive yourself if certain things didn't go right. Um, you know, as as long as you do your very best to try and make events, you know, in my, in, for me personally, it's to make them inclusive and accessible. Um, and so as long as I'm trying to achieve those goals, I feel like I'm, I'm doing the work that I kind of set out to do. That is such good advice. Hopefully our listeners will take that into account when they are planning their own outreach events. So thank you so much for watching. Thank you for being here, Parmbir. This was so helpful. And I'm excited to do more outreach spotlight videos in the future. So stay tuned and we will see you next time. Bye. Yes.